Good morning, everybody. I think we can start. We will still be, you know, having uh, uh, participants coming in, and uh, but uh, in meanwhile, we don't have, you know, so much time. So we better start, and then we'll t we'll take it from there. So once again, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Tatiana Krylova. I'm head of uh, enterprise branch at uh, Jungtat. So and we're here at our uh, Empratech Global Summit. Uh, 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 during, which is one of our side events uh, during the uh, Global Entrepreneurship Congress uh, and uh, the summit this year focusing on inclusive entrepreneurship. Uh, so first of all, I would like to thank uh, Global Entrepreneurship Congress that is uh, for the sixth time gives us this opportunity for us and this space uh, to discuss with participants uh, the Empratech program, uh, its impact and its role in entrepreneurship promotion. And uh, I also would like to thank the government of Bahrain and uh, Tamkin, the uh, co-hosting uh, hosting institution and co-hoster of this uh, Empratech Summit for uh, outstanding hospitality. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, as I said, uh, the uh, 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 summit is focusing on inclusive entrepreneurship, in particular uh, uh, emphasizing, uh, emphasizing fostering entrepreneurial mindset towards inclusive growth. Uh, just uh, for uh, those who are not familiar with Empratech, uh, a few words about what Empratech is about. So it comes uh, from uh, uh, two Spanish words, uh, emprendedores, entrepreneurs, and uh, technologia, technology. It's a flagship capacity building of Jungtat on unleashing entrepreneurial potential of entrepreneurs and building competitive SME sector. Uh, as I said, Empratech uh, it comes from two Spanish words, and this is because the first uh, Empratech program was installed in Argentina in 1988, and we'll hear today more from our uh, uh, you know, Argentina Empratech Center, uh, which is the, the first center established in the world uh, uh, 30 years ago, and last year uh, uh, they celebrated and we were invited to celebrate the 30-year anniversary of Empratech Argentina. So throughout these years, we have 30 years of uh, development of the program. So we are have uh, you know close to half a million graduates of the program in about 50 countries, uh, and uh, for now we have about more than you know 25 uh, requests from countries uh, to install and protect, pending uh, uh, funding uh, uh, and possibility for financing of this uh, request. So what's different with, um, uh, with uh, Empratech, it's really a unique program based on behavioral approach to entrepreneurship. So it enhances entrepreneurial potential and competencies of participants based on behavioral approach, uh, which is really quite different from other uh, approaches. And when we talk about personal entrepreneurial competencies, these are non-new words. These are 10 competencies clustered in three clusters, achievement, planning, and power. What make, makes it different? Uh, from any other program is again, as I said, this methodology that really first provides a diagnostics of the level of development of these entrepreneurial competences, uh, competences and what is even more important, provides the tools and equipment uh, uh, and equips uh, uh, participants uh, uh, with uh, instruments how to unleash this uh, uh, potential uh, of, uh, and development of uh, personal entrepreneurial competences. Uh, why Jungtat is engaged? Jungtat is uh, one of United Nations agencies. It's a focal point uh, on uh, economic development. And uh, uh, in this regard, of course, SMEs and entrepreneurship logically is one of key pillars of uh, uh, you know, promoting uh, sustainable and inclusive growth. And uh, uh, that's why uh, the program on SME entrepreneurship development is one of uh, uh, key aspects and key elements of a uh, mission of Jungtat to promote a sustainable, uh, sustainable development. And uh, in this regard, I just, uh, of course, it's uh, small letters, uh, but I wanted to bring it up that uh, last year, in November, uh, uh, Empratech was uh, recommended by uh, General Assembly of United Nations as a key program on uh, promoting entrepreneurship through behavioral approach. So that's really quite an achievement that, you know, the specific program uh, of uh, UN agency uh, is now included in the uh, General Assembly resolution which is called Entrepreneurship for Sustainable Development. Mm -hmm. 
So talking about the role of Emperor Tech uh, in inclusive growth, I would like really to highlight that actually inclusive approach to entrepreneurship promotion is sort of a DNA of Emperor Tech. You know, it's actually visible through its uh, network and geography, through target groups and through different dimensions that uh, uh, Emperor Tech uh, delivers uh, or within, within which Emperor Tech is delivered in uh, countries uh, that uh, have Emperor Tech centers, such as financial, social, and other dimensions. And uh, uh, if we talk about, uh, you know, the geography, so here is a map of Emperor Tech centers. You could see that, you know, it's quite present in Africa and Latin America, in Caribbean as well. And then, of course, it is in uh, Asia, uh, in Europe, and of course, it's also in Middle East. So uh, uh, it's really quite a coverage, and uh, as I already mentioned, we have many more requests, and I also would like to highlight here that actually, uh, you know, the program is de de delivered uh, in uh, countries with different level of economic development, in developing countries as well as least developed countries, but also in transitional economies and in developed countries. We delivered and uh, 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 workshops in Switzerland and in Spain, and uh, so it's again, you know, really a very inclusive approach uh, towards uh, entrepreneurship promotion. So then uh, we use, when we talk about Emperor Tech, we, we uh, you know, the inclusive, inclusiveness of entrepreneurship, uh, uh, its role in entrepreneurship promotion could be summarized in for you. It's unleashing of entrepreneurial potential. Uh, it's based on a unique methodology. The methodology was developed at Harvard University through extensive and intensive research and testing throughout different continents uh, to uh, prove the point that there is some core uh, uh, a core element, you know, in all successful entrepreneurs. And this core element consists of these 10 competencies that I mentioned before. And uh, uh, again, this is uh, something that is, uh, uh, that is a foundation for this uh, entrepreneurship, uh, um, uh, entrepreneurship promotion uh, methodology called Emperor Tech. And then it is universal. And this, this universality is really something that, again, highlights, promotes, and enhances inclusive nature of the program. Uh, we delivered the program to poor population and rich population. For example, we had, you know, really very wealthy entrepreneurs from India at some point uh, uh, who were participants of the workshop and, uh, you know, very uh, uh, poor population, uh, sorry, to a wealthy population and to poor participants in Ethiopia, uh, really with, you know, in rural areas, uh, very, uh, you know, very um, uh, challenging environment. We, developed, we delivered it for people with low literacy, like in Panama and in some other countries. I just brought here some examples. And people with a very sophisticated level of education and mindset, such as scientists, uh, uh, managers in the you know, scientific institution uh, in Russia. Uh, we delivered it in, uh, you know, for participants in very you know, diverse industries, uh, in agribusiness in Mozambique. In Mozambique, affordable housing in Zambia, sustainable tourism in Tanzania, food industry in Vietnam, and we can really, the list is very long. So this is again to prove the point that it's really not only very, you know, uh, universal, so that, you know, target groups could be different because the competences are the same, but target groups, groups could be different. And then, of course, that also uh, uh, allows uh, for uh, quite a significant level of uh, inclusiveness. So then we delivered it for mature entrepreneurs and those with ideas, for people uh, who are retired, as well as very young people. We have representatives from our center and protect center in, in Uganda, who has very, very you know, significant portfolio of programs for youth. Uh, we uh, deliver it for women empowerment, and we have uh, uh, Buzi uh, Bango, who is director of Empretech Center from Zimbabwe, who will also talk about that. We now started to develop, uh, deliver programs uh, for immigrants and refugees. We actually developed a specific uh, um, uh, guide, policy guide, for, uh, on which is called Entrepreneurship and Migration. And in uh, addition to this, and within this framework, we again, you know, uh, now de deliver the workshops uh, for this uh, uh, target group of population in countries that need such, uh, such instrument. Uh, we also deliver this uh, for people with limited capabilities, like in South Africa, you know, the program was delivered uh, to people in wheelchairs. And in some other countries, in Colombia, for example, they recently adapted it for uh, 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 use uh, with um, uh, uh, limited 
um, uh, limited abilities as well. And uh, so then other groups, such as managers, uh, such as government representatives, of course, that needs a bit of modification and tailoring. But again, the, the content is the same. The methodology is the same. It's about you know, identification and then fostering key competences that I believe to be really key success factors for people who decide to, uh, uh, to start their own businesses. And then, again, getting back to our point of this discussion today, it's uniting. It's uniting through the Emprotec Global Network. Uh, normally, we run Emprotec programs, uh, uh, a program in uh, uh, member states, in countries who are interested in that, through establishment of uh, local uh, national Emprotec centers. And they are all united through uh, different events that we have, like this summit or we also have Emprotec directors meeting. So it's really communication and networking that you know, brings all these uh, uh, centers and Emprotecers who took the program together. And as I mentioned already, cooperation through Emprotec centers. So um, uh, in this regard, we can say that Emprotec is for you. So it is for you. And uh, so those who didn't take it yet, uh -huh. who didn't join the Emprotec network, you are very much welcome to uh, join us. And uh, so with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, this is really my introductory remarks uh, about the uh, Emprotec uh, to bring us all on board so that we have more or less understanding of what Emprotec is about. And uh, so now I'm really very pleased, uh, unless you have any questions. Uh, so we can, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, hello, thank you for your nice introduction. Uh, could you just uh, introduce, uh, Give me more information about how we can join the Empretech. Uh, to join Empretech, uh, you know, because again, it's a program of uh, UNCTAD, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, which is an intergovernmental body of United Nations. So normally, uh, we would need to have a request uh, from uh, uh, an agency uh, in the country uh, to come to uh, Secretary General of UNCTAD. Uh, with approval or uh, soliciting then discussions with the government agency to give us a green light. Uh, but having said that, I would like to stress that uh, the hosting institution could be, uh, you know, any type of institution that is uh, cooperating uh, and uh, uh, engaged in uh, entrepreneurship promotion in the country. But normally we start with a request, but then of course the request should be followed by uh, raising funds because that would need uh, financial support. As I mentioned, we have about uh, more than 25 requests from countries that are pending financing. But here we normally also can join forces and to see how we can raise funds. Yes. Oh. Sorry. Um, yeah. My name is Judica and I work for the United Nations Population Fund in Chad. Um, I have two questions. The first one, I want to know how uh, Empretec is working with other UN agencies. Do you have any link with other UN agencies? And if so, what are the agencies? Second thing, you said you are in different countries and are still Cameroon, Benin. So uh, what do you mean by being in that country? Do you have an office there? Um, do you have representative? If so, it would be good to share also um, the different contacts so that we can link up with them. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, of course, as a you know, UN agency, we very closely work with our sister agencies. Uh, in uh, Emprotec in particular, we work with, uh, very closely with UNDP in those countries where uh, you know, UNDP is uh, engaged and interested in such activities. Uh, we also work in some particular programs, we worked with uh, ITC, uh, International uh, Trade Center, and uh, uh, also with ILO. In fact, in uh, Zambia and Tanzania, these are you know, so-called so one UN project type of activities where <coughs> different agencies are involved and uh, we are there with our component on entrepreneurship skills facilitation. So, uh, um, and we can talk more about, you know, some, we, we, we also cooperate very closely with UNIDO in Ethiopia, so that we have a number of uh, uh, examples uh, that we could also discuss further on, uh, maybe, uh, you know, after the meeting. Uh, in terms of offices, as I said, that, you know, we have, uh, uh, we have these installations normally through, uh, uh, first we start working with a hosting institution, and then uh, this hosting institution or other institutions that are involved in entrepreneurship promotion, they set up an, a national Emprotec Center. It's not a UN office, it's not a UNCTAD office, it's a separate legal entity, national legal entity, but we work very closely with these uh, entities, uh, providing our methodology, 
and uh, again also uh, cooperating through the network of Empratech centers and uh, joint meetings. Okay, if I could ask you please, then maybe we can you know, keep questions uh, for uh, you know, further discussion, uh, because we have quite a number of speakers for today, so let's uh, you know, uh, move in, in, in that uh, uh, mode. So I'm really very pleased uh, to now to give the floor uh, to uh, Mr. Ahmed Hassan Janahi, who represents uh, Tamkin uh, here in Bahrain uh, for his introductory remarks. Please, you have the floor, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the UNCTAD for having me today in this session as well. And to thank you and welcome you all to Bahrain. Uh, thank you for being part of the session and thank you for being in Bahrain actually and visiting us uh, during these three days. We'd like to see all of you throughout those three days, whether those are social events or the public events. Um, let me start by saying uh, Bahrain has been one of the countries, just like the rest of the countries in this region, depending on oil for a while. And people might still think that Bahrain actually depends on oil for its incomes and, and GDPs. But that's incorrect. We believe we reached a conclusion today, maybe after years, that the uh, contribution of oil is not sustainable, especially with the changes of prices of oil since 2015. And if we were like the rest of this region, depending on oil continuously, I think we would have failed to uh, sustain the standards of living for our people. So the government of Bahrain has prioritized entrepreneurship as one of the solutions. And of course, one of the deals to achieve even the sustainable development goals, the global goals that are accepted uh, globally uh, by everybody. Um, one of the initiatives that were created in this part of the world, in Bahrain specifically, to help achieving these goals uh, was something called Temkin, or the National Labor Fund. By the way, Temkin in Arabic means, means em enablement or empowerment. And that's what we do. So uh, the host organization for the GEC uh, in Bahrain, which is Temkin, uh, is here basically to do something similar to the Impratec program that the UNCTAD have created. However, just for the local, uh, for the local space. So what we do is we, we as well try to help entrepreneurs to establish. And not just the local entrepreneurs even the international entrepreneurs, but that's for the local market specifically. We as well try to help entrepreneurs to plan their businesses. We have programs to help them to, uh, for you, we have some youth programs to help them uh, to, uh, to have some business plans, to establish a better understanding and better awareness of what entrepreneurship means. Uh, we have programs to help powering, as, as my colleague have, have mentioned earlier. And we are a funding agency at the end of the day. So, if you decide to open a business in Bahrain to help achieve one of those sustainable development goals, we'd be able by all means to help you by funding 50% of the cost of establishing that business, whether that's, you just name it. What do you need to start a business? You need machinery equipment, then we can help you with 50% of the cost of that. If you need to bring employees, we can help you up to 70% of the cost of that. If you need to do whatever. What we're trying to say here, we want entrepreneurship to be an option for the people coming to this country. Because just like the UNCTAD have mentioned earlier, Tatiana have mentioned earlier, entrepreneurship is definitely one of the topics that has to be an inclusive topic for everybody around the world. And for us in Bahrain, we believe it's one of the solutions for the country. Uh, I, I don't want to take much time. Uh, I just like, I, I just like to say that whatever this discussion is going to take us or lead us to, it's something that we can do, whether that's in Bahrain or in somewhere in Africa or somewhere in the US. But whatever we're gonna agree on, we need to establish a plan on, on going forward with it. Probably UNCTAD can be a good umbrella for us to, to go forward with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, one quick question, if there is any, to ask Tamkin. please. Um, I was just wondering whether Tamkin might consider hosting Impratec in Bahrain. Do you see possibilities of that happening? Um, actually, yes. I think we've, we've established some, some contact with the UNCTAD last year during the GEC as well, and thanks to GEN, the, General, uh, the Global Entrepreneurship Network, for establishing this sort of, uh, of, of networks and connections. 
Uh, I think there is a possibility for us to host, to be the host company or the host organization uh, for the, or the host partners uh, in Bahrain for Empretec and also other programs that you may have uh, within your networks as well. Thank you. Okay, so that concludes our introductory session and we now move uh, to uh, discussions of the uh, uh, subject matter of the, uh, uh, of the summit. And it's really my pleasure to introduce Mr. Nigel Chanakira, who is our keynote speaker for to this uh, event. Uh, uh, Executive Chairman of Success Motivation Institute from Africa. Uh, and uh, so before uh, we start with that, I really would uh, like to say how pleased we are to have uh, uh, Nigel with us today. Uh, before I was talking about the, uh, the Empretec methodology, and we don't have really time, but we can go into this at a later stage about high impact that Empretec has on participants. And when I first uh, was uh, myself exposed to Empretec as a you know, head of branch uh, that uh, hosts the Empretec program in Geneva, uh, I thought it sounded to be too uh, nice, to be too uh, nice to be true, talking about impact of uh, Empretec on, on participants. And then at some point, uh, uh, Mr. Chanakira, he came to Geneva as one of first Empretecers in Zimbabwe uh, to actually tell us his story about impact of Empretec on, uh, on, uh, on, on his life and his business. So for me, it was a turning point, really, at that stage. You know, uh, I completely changed my view about the uh, impact of the Sempratec through these really life, uh, life examples, like li life stories. So it's really a pleasure to have uh, Mr. Chanakira today with us. So you have the floor, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana, for those kind remarks. Indeed, I'm a product of Empritech, and I also have the privilege of having Usibango next to me. Uh, she actually was my, my coach at, uh, at Empritech and took me through the motions of setting up uh, a business and all those personal entrepreneurial competencies that were listed. And I became a product of the product and continue to market Empritech. I actually used the very Empritech business plan to establish a financial group of companies called Kingdom Financial Holdings. And that became an award-winning uh, enterprise. And uh, ultimately, it was listed on the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange. And then further, we did a merger and became a London-listed entity. And so it shows that the impact of uh, Empritec uh, can be quite significant in terms of how far it can go. Uh, I then, of course, uh, have come back and focused on training other entrepreneurs through Success Motivation Institute and then also working with Empritech. The subject matter that I was asked to speak about today is the role of microfinance in, facil in the facilitation of inclusive business and finance. And clearly, uh, when microfinance was mooted, Microfinance was seen as a provision of financial services to low-income people, and it has long been considered a strong tool in facilitating financial inclusion and building long-term uh, resiliency in the face of unexpected hardships for vulnerable individuals and households throughout the world. And clearly, be it migrants or immigrants or the poorest of the poor, uh, this is a solution in terms of making sure that they have access to financial resources. And uh, Yunus Muhammad is really, as a Nobel Peace Prize winner, he is uh, credited and considered the father of uh, microfinance. And he being a social entrepreneur, banker, economist, and civil society leader, pioneered the work in giving tiny loans to millions of people, poor people, with no, commercial, uh, no access to commercial banking facilities. He even included in his model giving access to finance to destitute widows, uh, abandoned wives, landless laborers, yeah. rickshaw drivers, sweepers, and beggars. And the New York Times interestingly reported in 2006 that the Nobel Committee praised Eunice who at the age of 66 at the time formed the Grameen Bank, 
which was uh, founded in 1983 and began to offer microcredit solutions for combating the rural poor in Bangladesh and inspiring a lot of similar schemes uh, of development around the world. I would like to say that I also as a banker and economist became quite infused. Uh, although I was focused on high street banking, I saw an opportunity within Zimbabwe to create the largest microfinance institution. And uh, interestingly, that was chaired by Busi as well. And we went on to offer microfinance loans to over 200,000 Zimbabweans per annum on a revolving short-term basis in giving small loans with a maximum limit of 100,000 uh, US dollars equivalent per person. But the average loan size was really about $200. And so these were largely revolving loans. And clearly, in the course of time and with technology, we were able to perfect that model. Um, and I did sell out of my bank in 2013, and that microfinance entity continues to exist today. But clearly, what is possible now, if you look at it from a global perspective, is there are a lot of imitators of these microfinance institutions. And banks themselves have gone on to realize that microfinance is very different from commercial banking per se. You cannot do high street commercial banking almost simultaneously and with the same methodologies. You've got to tweak the model to suit the cultures, to suit the environment, of the poorest of the poor within those populations. And uh, if you look from a global perspective, uh, since we are at a global uh, conference, in 2016, for example, banks catered for only 33 of the total number of borrowers for microfinance clients from a global perspective. Uh, according to Convergence's microfinance parameter statistics, the global micro-lending uh, micro landscape has been experiencing a slow but steady growth. In 2016, microfinance institutions reached 132 million low-income clients with a loan portfolio of $102 billion. The total number of borrowers in the global microfinance space is estimated to have reached about 151 million people in 2018. Now, if you look at that statistic, in a global population of almost 8 billion people, and where we estimate that, um, uh, you know, we've got a lot of impoverished people, you can see that that's a drop in the ocean. And that means that there's lots of scope in terms of assisting uh, the poorest of the poor. And if you look at the number of people that are living on less than a dollar a day from a global perspective, it becomes imperative for us to con consider uh, financial literacy as a serious subject matter, but also to allow for the growth of microfinance institutions and support them by all means possible. There are arguments that uh, would also test the theory whether small, medium enterprises can truly benefit from microfinance organizations. And uh, there are issues that pertain, for example, to the quantum of credit that is available within the total money supply or credit that is offered within a nation. And then there is the aspect of what charges are actually levied to those individuals. Interest rates themselves can be quite punitive as we've seen right across the African continent, in that there are high charges in terms of basic uh, banking charges, and there are also high charges in terms of interest rates. The alternative, of course, being banks, who normally then don't give access to credit uh, for the poorest of the poor. Yet, uh, if you look at microfinance uh, clients, they are often just below ab or above the poverty line. And their commonly de defined earnings are $1.25 US, US dollars, that is, a day. And normally women constitute the bulk of these borrowers. Now, if you look specifically at the experience that we've had in Zimbabwe, 
60% uh, of our portfolio was actually women. And the default ratio on the part of women was considerably less than that of their male counterparts as borrowers. And so it's a good experience in the sense that it's high impact. Uh, most loans that are taken out by the male counterparts are actually used for consumption purposes. And whereas if you look at women, they are normally used for productive purposes, uh, developing the home uh, in terms of home improvements, uh, education loans, and loans that are, are linked to health improvement of the entire household. Um, in Zimbabwe itself, I think it's a hotbed for microfinance. We have about 20 formal banking institutions and over 200 microfinance uh, institutions, of which only six are deposit taking. So that means they have to either build their own capital uh, and put that capital at risk and then be able to extend loans on the back of funding that they are obtaining from banks and other institutions such as pension funds and insurance companies. By virtue of that, building an ideal micro uh, uh, ecosystem rather uh, for the uh, micro, small, medium enterprises becomes vital. We see that in Zim, only about less than 5 to 8 percent is targeted of the deposits towards microfinance uh, entities. And worse still, when the economy gets into a hyperinflation, those lendings to small, medium enterprises can get as low as 2 percent in terms of the ratio of loans to the aggregate deposits that are available. But certainly, uh, the likes of Empritec then offer the skills for a person to be able to come through and borrow money from microfinance enterprises. What we've gone on to do, and this is an area that I've been involved with, is enhancing the financial literacy of a nation. And we were able to do that by running television programs in the vernacular language, in the sense that people could then understand and then be able to come and borrow uh, from, from us. The other issue was an, a comprehension of the necessary financial documents that are to be presented to bankers or microfinanciers. And in essence, it's important that they understood that there are three financial statements, an income statement, a balance sheet, and a cash flow statement. And they need to be taught that the most comprehensive of these is, of course, the cash flow statement. So what we've gone on to do since 2013 is to actually develop an app which we collaborated with a South African company in order to make financial literacy accessible in a manner that is low cost. Normally, you'd go to an accountant, a chartered accountant, or qualified accountant who charges an arm and a leg you know, to be able to offer you the documentation that would impress a banker. But in the same vein, you are only starting out. So our app now costs a dollar for an individual that allows that individual to be able to access the app, which sits on a cloud, and they can then present uh, financial statements which make sense. This creates an opportunity, I think, for longer or what we would call medium to long term finance. Because your mi microfinance entities are normally just giving loans for a period of a month to three months, typically. But some projects, for example, if they're linked to farming, you need a longer period in terms of loan. So that loan cycle within itself would necessitate um, SME or microfinance type of insurance schemes in the event that there is droughts, as is commonplace in a country like Zimbabwe. There is also opportunities to build microfinance, uh, to build a mi what I would call micro ecosystems for the micro SMEs, in the sense that we can then use technologies such as drones uh, for planting, for checking on crops, for checking on uh, 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 husbandry products, etc. All these would call for a change in the curriculum uh, of the education system. 
uh, mentorship, job shadowing, uh, enhancing science and technology, the capacity to pitch, uh, you know, for finance, is all training that I think now should be focused at an elementary level. And then, of course, we must move on to build an ecosystem that allows for pension funds and insurance companies, venture capital companies, to feed into these microfinance organizations so that they have access to larger sums of money. They can le uh, also give out loans for longer periods of time. The last point that I would like to make is that I think we are on the cusp of something truly significant with the emergence of mobile money. Normally, the far, uh, you know, people who are living in what we would call the hinterlands now have access to mobile money. They've also got access to communications. And that means we can also train and mentor them using technology, and then we can provide access to funding for them. Most of these are using the uh, mobile money systems for purposes of making payments. I think we can build ecosystems now to train them, to network them to markets, and then to give them access to medium to long-term finance into the future. I'm excited. I always say money follows a compelling vision, and I think that the world system has adequate funding for us to be able to give access to the poorest of the poor, to get access to credit at a microfinance level in a cost-effective way. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Um, a quick question to Nigel, if uh, any. Okay, we will have a specific session on Q&A session after we uh, go through all our presentations. So please keep your questions uh, that we can uh, engage in the interactive debate after we uh, proceed with the um, uh, panel uh, uh, with participation of selected Empretech centers. So our first speaker uh, would be Mr. Jorge Lawson, uh, president of Empretech Argentina and member of the board of the Central Bank of Argentina. Uh, as I mentioned before, Empretec Argentina is our first center globally installed, uh, established in 1988. And uh, so it's really uh, a pleasure and uh, honor to have you here with us, uh, uh, Jorge. So please, you have the floor. Thank you, Tatiana. Good morning, everybody. I'm Jorge Lawson from Argentina, in the other side of the world. Um, I am president of Empretec. Argentina Foundation, Managing Director of Global Entrepreneurship Network, and Director of Argentina National Bank. But fundamentally, I am an entrepreneur. I, am, I will try, uh, in my country, the original language is the Spanish, but they will try to express my idea in English. Like Frank Sinatra, I will, de, I will do it in my way. I'm very excited because the topic selected by United Nations is very important to the human development because the inclusion is very important for the people excluded. Let me show, to start my presentation, a real excluded people. I will present you Monica. I know Monica. I help Monica. She is Monica. Todo lo que significan delantales de mozo, cofias, picheras, bandanas, para restaurantes y todo lo que tiene que ver con el área de comida. Yo soy una mujer proveniente de un caso grave de violencia y después de eso eh, me puse en pie, renga primero, después con muletas, después con... Como pude sola, yo no tengo familia, seguí adelante con la ayuda de la gente que se fue cruzando en mi camino. Yo quisiera... Eh, que todas las máquinas las manejen otras mujeres, que sean productos de, de, de hogares que hayan salido de los hogares de violencia y necesiten trabajar para criar a sus hijos. Tengo la fe puesta siempre en que todo se puede lograr, pero la felicidad más grande está en que la gente cuando lo ve me dice 
Muy bueno, me gusta mucho, quedó bien. Mientras yo pueda ofrecer algo, quiero que el desamparo sea lo menor posible para... No se puede esperar todo del Estado. No se puede esperar todo de los demás. Hay que hacer. Hay que hacer. We go to take action. In Spanish, hay que hacer. But what is action? For us, action is this program. It's a real program. It's not an idea. The challenge of including by bringing opportunities. One year ago, on this meeting, we selected 1,000 bank employees. And we talked about inclusion with them and presented the method for to include the people. This is the program, the real program. And for us, financial inclusion is not a social assistance. It's not only providing banking service to the excluded sectors. It not give a card, one card, and put money on the month because this is more exclusion. For us, financial inclusion is to help them develop their dreams, skill, or needs. It's not just an economic issue, it's also social. With the financial inclusion, we can create new companies. We can generate genuine jobs. Many people can make progress. But beyond our vision is the reality of the excluded. Do we know what they think or need? I asked to the banker on that meeting, do you know what the excluded people think or need? For example, they never came to the bank because, because they think, I don't qualify. I can't justify incomes. I don't have history. They never came to the bank. And what, what the banker think. What are you doing here? If you don't have warranties, if you don't have history, you does not qualify. It's a perfect barrier. Then, if they are not going to come to the bank, we must go for them. And there are another barriers the real barrier, the bureaucracy, for example. Look. Quería darme de alta en autónomos. Ventanilla de información, modelo TA1. Lo cumplimenta en esa mesa y después. Me traído relleno. No ha rellenado esa casilla. Vaya a las mesas de la entrada y. Traído dos copias, escritas y revisadas. Le falta el impreso de Hacienda. Y la fotocopia. Muy bien, Rubita. Tú lo has querido. Fotocopia del DNI. Número de cuenta. Fotocopia de la tarjeta de la Seguridad Social. Fotocopia de los impresos de Hacienda. Doble fotocopia del modelo 036, numerado y grapado. familiar for you? They are not only in the banks, they are in all the public parts. These governments are everywhere and they generate barriers. We need more entrepreneurs in the public function because the entrepreneur can understand that the people need and they can develop 
the policies that the people need for to develop more entrepreneurs. I'm an entrepreneur in the public function. And believe me, that is an incredible probability to develop policies. There are different kinds of entrepreneurs, but some are most vulnerable. They start viability or necessity. They are far from the opportunities. We are in the other side, and we must understand our purpose. We talk about that with the bankers, with the 1,000 people, bankers, one year ago, and talk about our purpose, their purpose, and express that they need to understand that we can change a person's life. We need to go and find the excluded people. Finding an entrepreneur is easy. Entrepreneurs are everywhere. For example, in the news, in the media, on TV, in the newspaper, they talk about the entrepreneurs today because the entrepreneurs are in the agenda. But for the excluded, we need a method. We need to look for them because they don't care for us. Excuse me. I show you now a real video we, when we go for the excluded people in the neighborhood with Emiliano. Emiliano is a worker, the construction worker. And we talked with Emiliano and said, Emiliano, introduce us the people that are working in your neighborhood and they need help for to grow. This is the video. Bueno, Emiliano es, trabaja en la construcción, pero él también tiene una idea, tiene un proyecto, pero yo le pedí que me presente a mucha gente que él conoce. Felipe Belisario tiene un emprendimiento que es, se dedica a la corte y confección. Daniel Campos, eh, un muchacho trabajador, se dedica a lo que es hacer el calzado. Evelyn Estrada, él hace lo que es repostería, todo lo que está diseñado a hacer todo tipo de tortas. Pero Luján Gutiérrez se dedica a lo que es a la, a la panadería, que hace todo tipo de, de, de pan. Pamela del Carmen se dedica a hacer todo tipo de estampado, hace estampado de, de remeras, también hace en, en tazas, en, en vaso. Este impacto que va a generar en, en el barrio es o sea, para poder crecer. Eh, de todo el único emprendimiento que, que, que se está haciendo en el barrio es realmente para crecer y dar trabajo a mucha gente. Estamos viendo a ver si es la posibilidad hoy con el Banco Nación que nos quiere dar una mano, eh, que sea un poco para que arranque la gente, o sea, un empujoncito para que, que puede hacer algo. This is a real method. method. This is a real people. In one block, 10 projects, the people that are working. They, they are invisible for the formal economy, for the politician people, but they are alive. There is an Emiliano in each neighborhood. And we have more alias in the neighborhood, in the towns, foundation, NGOs, companies, universities. It's necessary to listen to them and support them. Approach, visit the enterprise, know, imagine, understand, get involved in two, in two words, take action. In the Argentina National Bank, we define the purpose. We take the initiative. We look for them, and we become agents of change. This is the result. When I start my position in the bank, look, 24 trades, credit for the excluded people. When this program started, 1,800 trades. 
but in March 2018, we started this program, and look the result. 38,000 new credits for excluded people, and more of 35,000 people's new customer banking. They were out of the system. The average loan is $5,000. We are aligned with the policies of the United Nations, with the SDGs and the goal. To conclude my presentation, in the world there are or there is a lot of money, but the important thing is the method to reach to exclude it. The money is if only money in the banks, in the reporters, is not the real money for the excluded people. We need method because we need that the money go to the excluded people. We must be teachers and inspire the entrepreneurs. We must be mentors, discover their passion, see their potential, develop the skill, transmit values. We can be like a lighthouse, but we don't work to create bosses and employees. The world needs more leaders, more mentors, more dreamers, and entrepreneurs. We can create and approach opportunities, and they must, must be inclusive. Opportunities should be for everyone. Thank you. Thank you for you very much. Uh, we have, uh, you know, just uh, time for one question, maybe right away after the presentation, or otherwise we can again leave it until uh, until we have a Q and A session. Okay, so with this, I would uh, uh, I'm very pleased to give the floor to uh, Ms. Buzibanga, who is the CEO of uh, Empratech Zimbabwe. Uh, who is one of our most active centers uh, in Africa. So, Buzi, you have the floor, please. Okay. And uh, thank you very much um, to the people of Bahrain and uh, Angtad for having me here to share with you our experiences of um, inclusive entrepreneurship and how we have done it uh, in Zimbabwe and in other countries in Africa, we have had the opportunity to work in. Um, so um, I was asked to talk about inclusive entrepreneurship focusing on the rural communities. And uh, when I looked at what we define as a rural community, I found that it actually includes uh, even men. It includes both young and older women, as well as it includes the youth. So basically, a rural community is very similar to an urban community in the way in which it is stratified. But what differs is mostly the circumstances. So quite often, uh, when you work in the field of entrepreneurship, you get questions or comments or remarks that ask you, what is entrepreneurship? And uh, we all come up with different answers. But in line with uh, the subject matter that I'm going to present on, I have decided to respond to that question in a number of ways. Number one, I find that entrepreneurship is a solution to reducing poverty. It is a tool for economic growth. It is also a strategy for creating employment. 
It's a solution for dealing with social and socioeconomic problems, as well as being a strategy for improving people's livelihoods and increasing the standard of living for people. It's a method for creating wealth at the higher level. But for all that to be achieved, entrepreneurship needs to be inclusive in reality. So why, in, um, how do we define inclusive entrepreneurship? I simply say it's a situation where, where in anyone who would like to be an entrepreneur is able to do so without any barriers. So somebody wants to be an entrepreneur, there should not be any barriers. Whether those barriers are internally coming from you as an individual or they are externally driven from the environment. So maybe just to share a bit about my story and the story of Empretec Zimbabwe, focusing or related to what the subject matter is today. I will just share a few projects or programs that we have run which link to rural entrepreneurship and how we have managed to be inclusive in those programs. Firstly, we designed and managed a program wherein we supported um, 6,000 households, rural households, in the southern part of the country to come up with micro-enterprises. We also designed and are currently implementing a program wherein 4,500 young people, more of whom are young women, are being supported with entrepreneurship and business management skills as well as taking their products and their services to the markets, including accessing finance. We also designed and implemented other service providers with other service providers locally, regionally, and regionally in various sectors, initiatives in rural communities, where we work with um, other service providers in Zambia, in Malawi, to look at how rural communities could turn their produce and take it to the market. And we also supported rural-based women entrepreneurs to find local, regional, and international markets for their products. So with that background, I would like to see and share with you what I believe are some of the barriers that can come in to achieving uh, inclusive entrepreneurship. Firstly, the barriers could be endogenous. In other ways, they are coming from within the individual. Wherein the individual maybe is lacking certain skills, they could be entrepreneurial skills, they could be business management skills, or they could be skills of how to actually access funding. I think my colleague from Argentina just shared how the situation is in Argentina of a woman, a young woman trying to access a bank loan in the bank. They could also be exogenous, where external factors come into play. Maybe there are bad attitudes within those people that uh, the entrepreneur is dealing with. So how can we overcome these barriers? But maybe before we go there, let's look at a rural community, or women entrepreneurs, or young entrepreneurs. I believe they are a special, vulnerable, unique group of people. Often when you talk of poverty, a lot of people say poverty is the face of a woman, especially a young woman. They are disadvantaged in many fronts, culturally, socially, economically, and otherwise. They lack access. And by lacking access, I mean lacking access to opportunity, lacking access to funding, lacking access to markets, or even to the right networks that can actually open certain doors for them. Um, we also find that women are in the majority. They constitute 52% of the population, maybe worldwide. And when we look at the situation of women or young people, we need to be talking not of equity, not of equality, but of equity, whereby we recognize the disadvantage that the women and the young people have gone through or the rural communities have gone through and put in place strategies or tactics that will bring or level the playing field. But also, we need to understand that women in themselves are a big market. 
As several studies done by the World Bank and other institutions, our UN institutions, do confirm that 80% of spending budget in a household is controlled by a woman. So when we disadvantage a woman, we are actually disadvantaging the economy because that spending budget cannot be used properly if a woman is disadvantaged. So why should we include women or include rural entrepreneurs in, uh, in what we do? Women make better leaders, I believe, because they use both intuitive, intuitive and logical skills. They approach problems holistically, and studies have also confirmed that companies that are women-headed perform better. So hence, excluding women is not only disadvantaging the woman, but is disadvantaging economies, world economies. Local economic development from the village level up, we find that, as I said initially, the majority of the people are women. So if you want local economies to develop, it's better to empower the woman and develop the woman. There is an old adage that when you educate a woman, you educate a nation. Creation of local markets and circulation of money within the economy. So if you are able to empower the rural economy and include the rural economy in entrepreneurship, you are actually creating those local markets and enabling that money to circulate within that economy and strengthen that economy economically. So what are some of the models that we have used or how have we modeled inclusive entrepreneurship? We've come up with programs that are focusing just on women or rural-based entrepreneurs, special programs that deliberately say we are going to target just women or young women or we are going to target the rural economy. We also look at situations where if there is scoring of participants to be done, we actually accept women who even score lower than men to actually get into those programs because we want to include the women or we want to include the rural communities. Or you come up with a program where you say 60% of the participants in this program have got to be rural-based people or have got to be young women. Again, that's a way of making it more inclusive for the rural-based economies or our participants to actually be part of those programs. Or you come up with uh, initiatives where special technical skills that look at training rural-based economies or communities or rural-based women, where you realize that there are skills that they lack and that they need Initially, or originally, Nigel spoke about how we are using uh, technology to actually allow rural-based people to do banking using their phones. So they need to be trained in those skills for them to be able to use those phones for banking. Or you customize your entrepreneurship and business management training to the special needs of the women or the special needs of the rural communities. I think in some localities or some regions, there are certain days where you say it's not a working day. It could be a Wednesday or a Thursday or a Tuesday or a Friday. So when you are now running those programs, ensure that you actually take note of that and customize your programs around the cultures of the communities that you are dealing with. Special funding schemes, schemes for the rural-based communities I think currently there is a huge program that is running around worldwide that is being run, I think, by the World Bank called SEED, where the target is women entrepreneurs. Or you can come up with grants, and you are saying, we want to give grants to women and for them to start off their businesses, small grants. And then maybe as the business grows, they can actually then start getting loans as well or it could be through self-initiated schemes such as uh, savings and credit unions that the community in the rural area can run and actually be able to access funding for their businesses. So, in conclusion, when you run inclusive entrepreneurship programming, 
you actually lead to some of the following. You are able to build and strengthen more entrepreneurs in terms of increasing your private sector participation in the economy. You are able to actually build more competitive products and services because we've become more inclusive, we've got, we've got more entrepreneurs taking part and participating, and it actually helps to improve the quality and the range of products and services. You are looking at achieving more economic growth for an economy because it's now broad-based, you've got more people participating in entrepreneurship, or you also are able to broaden the tax base, so you're increasing what goes into the fiscus at the end of the day. You also help to create more employment. So instead of people saying, when I finish school, I'm going to go look for a job, you come up with programs that include them in entrepreneurship, and they can start to be the job creators as opposed to be job seekers. You help to reduce socioeconomic ills. I think quite often when you have people, particularly in areas like the rural communities, where they have nothing else to do, they end up going and doing the wrong things social things or economic things, theft, and all other things. So when you get them occupied through inclusive entrepreneurship programming, you are able to reduce those socioeconomic skills. It helps, again, to improve the standards of living. When more people are participating, you reduce dependency syndrome, and people are able to work for themselves. And finally, it leads to more developed and sustainable economies, I think, worldwide. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Buzi. Uh, any questions, comments? Uh, Ahmed, if you wanted to say something. Um, thank you, Buzi Wango, for, for, for the lovely presentation that you had. Uh, I just have a comment. I think it's a general comment more, more than a question. Uh, I think all of us around this table, we coming from different countries, uh, we have somewhat uh, similar problems. At least one or two problems are the same. Not necessarily the entire spectrum of problems that or challenges that you guys are facing in your countries is the same. But in a way or another, we all have similar problems. I, I, I'd be very sad, to be honest, if we leave this room today without having at least each one of us, one idea that's implemented somewhere else in the world, whether that's in Zimbabwe or in Argentina or in one of your other countries, I think it would be more useful for all of us to, at least during the discussion, to discuss some of the specifics of the initiatives rather than speaking of the objectives. Because I think inclusiveness, whether that's for women, rural, rural entrepreneurs, uh, uh, poor uh, uh, societies, as Nigel have mentioned, or even, or even youth entrepreneurs, I think all of those, we want to include them. But we, we, the, the bigger question is about the how, rather than about the what the problem is or what the objectives are. So maybe we should focus further uh, during the session today, maybe sometime after the presentations, and these are prepared, about the how can we help them. Thank you, Ahmed. This is a very useful suggestion. So then while we are uh, having uh, two uh, presentations that we have on the panel, so we can you know, start thinking about how. So, uh, so our next uh, uh, presenter is uh, uh, Ms. Renata uh, Henriques uh, from uh, Brazil, our you know, Ampratec uh, Central Ampratec program in Brazil. I mentioned uh, in the beginning that we are present in about uh, 50 countries with 40 centers running. Uh, but in Brazil, we have actually one national center, but 20, 27 regional centers of Empratec. This is really the biggest establishment uh, in our Empratec network. So thank you uh, for all your help in Sebrae, Renata. We really appreciate that you're uh, available for today's presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tatiana. Thank you, Mrs. Janahi, for hosting us, fellow colleagues. Um, I'd like to first say that it's lunchtime, so I promise not to take long. I know everyone wants to have some lunch. But before talking, I'd like to uh, introduce you my fellow colleagues from Sibrai, uh, Mrs. Marden from Sibrai Regional Office at Minas Gerais, and Mr. Julio from Sibrai um, Regional Office of Paraná. So, um, 
We're going to talk about women entrepreneurship today, right? And as Mrs. Najahi uh, mentioned, I'm going to talk about how we are dealing with this subject in Brazil, rather than what are the, you know, uh, what, ra rather why. But before that, let me just give you a quick glance about what Sebrae is. It is the Brazilian Small Business Development Agency. This is our headquarters in Brasilia. And we are a 47-year-old public and private institution. Our money comes from public money, but we operate in a private way. Basically, what we do is to foster entrepreneurship and develop small business capacity building. Uh, we have 27 regional offices plus 700 centers in every state of Brazil. Uh, Brazil has 200 million people, so it's quite a, a challenge to, um, to deal with that. We have over 6,000 direct employees, and we provided services uh, to over 2 million entrepreneurs last year. We basically deal in every sector, agriculture, services, trading, manufacturing. And we basically do training courses, access to finance, access to markets and innovation. Um, we are very glad to be a partner of UNCTAD for Improtech in Brazil for the last 25 years. I know Argentina is the first partner, right? 30 years in Argentina. And we respond to 61% of total participants of Improtech in the world. And um, if, you, if you ask me, Renata, who is the typical participant of Improtech in Brazil? I would say men, 63%. Uh, 49%, almost a half, already run a business, so they're not like beginners. They're young people, 25 to 34 years old, and they are educated. They almost a half hold a, an undergrad an undergrad de degree. But let's talk about women, right? These are just quick uh, glance of what we do and what we have to do with Improtech. Um, we've been working with women for a long time, but basically since some years ago, like five years ago, we've been working towards a more specific target in women. And if you ask me, okay, what should institutions would do to foster women entrepreneurship? I believe every one of us here, we have a kind of, you know, fostering institution. I would say two lessons learned, two things. First lesson, invest in soft skills development. That's what I've been he hearing uh, from the presentations of my colleagues, right? So soft skills, everything related to behavior. And Empretech is basically a seminar that works with um, behaviors, right? Em entrepreneurial behavior. And the second lesson would be, if you are an institution that fosters entrepreneurship and you want to help women to entrepreneur, you have to consider maternity constraints. Every case in Brazil that we have considered uh, that women, you know, uh, have kids and in most of the countries women are in charge of domestic activities. If you don't consider that while designing your capacity building strategy, the chances of failure are higher. So, uh, but before that, let's give you a quick glance of the numbers of the figures of women in Brazil. Um, women um, already open as many businesses as men in Brazil, 50-50 in 2008, 2018, last year. But only 35% of the 27 million businesses in Brazil are women-led. So what do, you, what do these figures show us? Women, uh, women are as much entrepreneur as a man, but women-led businesses die first. Right, because the second figure, we consider the established businesses, right? So what we're seeing here that women die first in terms of businesses, then businesses led by men. These are the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor 2008, uh, 2018, sorry, uh, research. In Brazil, women entrepreneurs are 16% more educated than men in numbers of years of study. But women-led enterprises annual revenue are 22% lower than men-led enterprises. Um, what about sectors? 
food and restaurant, fashion and cosmetics are the main sectors of women-led enterprises in Brazil. No problem at all. I love these sectors. But what about highly innovative sectors such as robotics, biotech, information technology, fintechs? If you look at these numbers, there's very few women in these sectors. This is a very nice one as well. Uh, women dedicate 18 less percent working hours to their enterprise than men. So men dedicate more hours to their businesses in Brazil, right? But what do women do in the hours that they are not running their businesses? So this is a very, very important um, number. I, I, I would encourage you to look at these numbers in your, in your countries as well. Basically, what women are doing when they're not running their businesses is that they are taking care of children and the house, right? So, summing up numbers, women-led businesses in Brazil are less profitable. They are situated in less innovative sectors, basically food, services, uh, cosmetics, and fashion, and they are less competitive. And if you look at the person, women entrepreneurs, they are more educated in years of study, they devote less numbers of hours to their businesses. Right, this, this is the summing up of the figures. And please don't take me wrong, when I, when I show these numbers to people, people usually get depressed, like, oh, that's so bad. But I think we should, you know, just face the reality, and we also should uh, recognize that um, the situation of women, at least in Brazil, right, my directors, is getting better. We were worse, right? In Brazil, we do not have any legal constraint. There's nothing in the law that, you know, is against women becoming an, an entrepreneur. I know that in many countries, there are legal barriers. The barriers in Brazil are 100% cultural, but it, it is as strong as legal, sometimes even more, right? Sometimes you change the law, but you don't change the culture because it's people's mind. So... Um, the conclusion is, women-led enterprises are, on average, less competitive and show higher failure rates. This is the truth. But what do we do with that? We can change that. And first of all, why is that so? Because if we are fostering institutions, we have to understand the problem so we can actually tackle the problem, right? So we're going to talk about hard skills and soft skills. Hard skills are those technical skills, right? So planning, uh, business planning, marketing, uh, managerial skills, these things, women are really good because they study more, right? They have more numbers of studies, so they're quite good in hard skills. But what about the soft skills? What about behavior? And it's a counterintuitive scenario because usually people think, Renata, but I guess women are, you know, know how to talk, women are you know, how, how to convince people. What are you talking about? Is women not very good in soft skills? That's, it doesn't, you know. But in entrepreneurship, what are the skills that we are looking for? In entrepreneurship, the skills that we are looking for is capacity to communicate, capacity to defend an idea. If you, if you are, for example, a board of investors, and they say, okay, Renata, you have to... You have 30 seconds to defend your enterprise to the board of directors. Oh my God, what, I, what do I do? So self-confidence, leadership, right? This, this is the kind of soft skills that we are talking about when we're talking about entrepreneurship. So, and the other thing is we have to be aware of limiting beliefs. I really don't believe, and there's no research, um, and every research do not say this, that there's a biological thing, woman or man, right? This is 100% cultural. And if it's cultural, we can deal with that. So how does culture affect women entrepreneurship? This is, this is a reflection that I, I leave to, to you, my fellow colleagues. Uh, how do you raise boys? How do you raise girls? What are the toys? What, are, you know, that we, what, what do you usually talk to these people, girls and boys, that are going to, you know, uh, become adults and what are the behaviors that they're going to, to, to do. Um, there's only one hard skill that women are worse than men. Do you know what it is? Would you, would you like to, to shoot? Finance. Women 
on average, uh, are worse in finance than men. Women, on average, tend to let the finance of, the end of her business to her husband or to the accountant. Is it true in your countries as well? Do you see that? Not very much? No? Good. I would like to hear from you. So in Brazil, um, this, is a, this, is a figure, very, this is a very common figure. And we asked Brazilian Central Bank a report about um, the number of lowers of regular banks to small businesses. And then we, we did a separation between loans provided by, for men and loans provided by women. And what we found out is women are better payers. They pay it very correctly. But on average, women pay higher interest rates, which doesn't, I, I quite don't understand, right? If we're better payers, why do we pay uh, higher rates, interest rates? I don't know the answer. We, we didn't have any study on that. But I believe, that's my personal opinion, that maybe because women are not very used to negotiate with banks, right? That's a thing of self-confidence. And the other thing, which in, in terms of numbers, um, let me just tell you a quick story. I don't know in your countries, but there's a thing that say that we, we grow up listening to these things. Like, men usually are better in numbers than girls. Do you have these in your countries? Or no, like mathematics? Not at all? Great. Um, I, I did my master's degree at the University of Cambridge in, in England, and I had a colleague that his PhD was, his PhD question was, when do girls give up liking mathematics? And his, and his findings were six to seven years old. On average in the world, but, well, his research was not at every country in the world. Well, he had some countries. But um, up to six and seven years old, both boys and girls show the same interest in mathematics and therefore the same result, right? Because when you like something, you probably, you know, study there. And there are two things that happen in this um, age that mm, let girls not liking mathematics as much. So the first thing is cultural things. Girls and boys uh, listen to their parents, professors, teachers, people saying, oh, boys are better in numbers, girls are better in humanities, in classics. So, yeah, you know, this thing that we listen. And the other thing is representation. This is really, really important, especially in entrepreneurship. You only dream to be what you see people like you becoming, right? So I'm a girl, I'm a little girl. I don't see women in engineers, I don't see women astronauts, I don't see women mathematicians, so that's not for me, right? So this is really, really important when we, are, when we are dealing with entrepreneurship. So what are the inspirations, what are the representations that we do? So I really believe that the girl, the, the, set, the six to seven years old girl that do not like mathematics is the 30 years old entrepreneur, woman entrepreneur that do not deal with the finance of their enterprises and let the husband do it, right? So just, just for us to have a reflection, I know every country has uh, its own reality. Um, I'm having some problems there. Okay, so the conclusion is, if we want to foster women entrepreneurship, we should definitely um, focus on mentoring and coaching programs. These are keys, because these are the kind of thing that work with soft skills. If we're just doing training courses, we usually don't talk about behavior, right? And that's what we need to talk about. If women do not have the self-confidence, of course women have self-confidence, but you know, in terms of researchers, that's what uh, the researchers uh, find out. Uh, we have to mentor them. So one of the good things that we are doing is um, when you get a group of senior entrepreneurs, group of senior group of entrepreneurs, and they are invited to like provide one to two hours in a week to mentor junior entrepreneurs. This is great because you're going to have a talk, you're going to you know, say things that maybe you're not comfortable about to, to talk when you are in a classroom. So this is really, really good. Um, and the second lesson, remember two lessons? The first one was 
um, invest in soft skills development. And the second lesson learned is when you think about women entrepreneurship, you have to consider maternity issues. Um, I would love to live in a world where women and men share uh, and divide the activities of raising children. But unfortunately, I do not live in this world. So um, one of the things that we should, as, as agencies of, of develop, as development agencies is, for example, consider online training programs because women, you know, they stay more at home. So if you consider online training programs, there are more chances of them to, you know, make it. Uh, the other thing is allow women to take children to training sessions. We had a very interesting experience in Brazil. I'm going to share it to you, with you. Um, one of the events that we do, a very huge event, is called uh, the Entrepreneur Fair. It's a week of many lectures, courses, training courses. I'm, I'm going. And this is, I mean, we had like 100,000 people, uh, entrepreneurs going in this fair. And there was this, this rule that we did. I mean, we didn't have a, a good thought on that, saying that it, it's forbidden to bring people under 14 years old. You had that. And then a woman entrepreneur called us and said, look, I'm a single mom. You know, I work eight hours a day, and I would love to go to this event of you. And, but I don't know, I, I, don't, I don't have anyone to, to let my children with. So can I bring my children to the event? And then we said, you know, that's a real problem. And then in the end, yes, okay. But we, did, we just didn't think about it. So think about it. If you're a woman and you have children and you're a single mom and you don't have money to, you know, let some, pay someone to let your children, you just don't go. It's impeditive. Is there any difference in terms of content in entrepreneurship? Mm, no. But in terms of delivering, the, 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 the course or the solution, yes, absolutely. And the other thing is engage men in the debate because this is a societal issue, right? It's an issue of the whole society. Um, and this is my last um, slide. This is the, prog the woman uh, entrepreneurship program that we are running in Brazil. It's a program, it's a three million US dollars program, two years. We basically do um, managerial training, so what, that's what we do, Sibrai, for the last 60 years, right? Um, planning, marketing, um, managerial skills in, in general, but we are also focusing on soft skills development. As I told you, this is key. If you just uh, train women on know how to you know, market the enterprise, but you don't talk about um, self-confidence, leadership, capacity to communicate, capacity to network, to do networking, mm, that's not going to happen. And business intelligence as well. And we have a very good partnership since we're, we are in UNCTAD right now. I'd like to mention that we have this UN Women Partnership. Um, and I would, in, I would encourage you to, to know as well, it's the um, letter of um, countries that signed this, this letter of empowerment, women empowerment, uh, with the UN. So this is really nice because the UN helps us to, first of all, um, know what our policies are and we learn with uh, international best practices uh, of women. Um, this is it. Thank you very much. Obrigada. I'm sorry for, the, for running uh, a little bit late. And I'll be more than glad to talk to you and to learn from you on how you do in, uh, in your countries and in your institutions. Thank you very much. Obrigada. Thank you, Renata. Uh, uh, actually, these, uh, you know, the points that you made, they make even more emphasis on the Empretech as a program that really deals with behavioral approaches and self-confidence and uh, you know, other skills that you're talking about. I mean, this is exactly where we see the impact uh, of Empretec program on participating uh, women. So thank you very much. We unfortunately don't have you know, a space now for questions. We have one more presentation uh, from Ranalda Mukasa, who represents uh, uh, Uganda, Empretec Uganda and actually talking about bringing uh, children uh, uh, for, you know, giving an opportunity for women to bring children. That's one of the programs that's being run in Uganda for people with low literacy, where actually women are allowed to bring children. 
to the to the Emperor Tech training. But anyway, so uh, uh, Ronaldo, you have the floor, please. Uh, thank you, Tatiana. Yeah, I think uh, I'll start off by saying thank you to the Bahrain team and UNCTAD for having us here. And I think I'm going to attempt to add to what my colleagues uh, have shared. I'm from Enterprise Uganda. We are the Empretech Center in Uganda. And I think, possibly put into two contexts, uh, I was asked to discuss inclusive entrepreneurship specifically for youth. And this group of people uh, in most of Africa, Africa is a very young continent, but I'll give an example of my country. In Uganda, about 77% of the population is below 30. That means every household you go to, chances are high that a father and a mother are looking after about eight people. So you have about eight people in your household. So when you think about the youth problem, for us, it is in every household. And um, most of uh, the approach or the exit which uh, many of our households have found to kind of how do you find wealth, how do you make it in the world, the answer has been education. So a number of our households have invested heavily in educating their children. So it's not unlikely to find a household where a young man has a university degree but has no job. And now the problem with unemployment here is that the job was the answer to the problem. So if you don't find a job, you have actually really a big problem. So a number of our households are struggling with that. You find a young man who has no job. You go to a rural community, someone has sold all their land, all their cows to educate, but the young person has no job. And these young people are inside, uh, within these households. So when we, uh, when we started uh, our Empretech program, our large focus was with more, you would say, medium-sized entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs who are growth-oriented. However, when we looked at the message, the message was even more necessary for these households because uh, the government currently is being asked, where are the jobs? I mean, you have one application and 500 people apply for one job, and it's hard to even choose who to give this job to. So most of our work with the youth has been actually answering the question of unemployment. When we look at entrepreneurship as a solution to this problem, I would want to start off by saying that it is in that context. And uh, as an organization, we picked the Empretech message and attempted to simplify it for this group of young people. And as we were simplifying it for the group of young people, we noticed that the problem wasn't just the young people. It was also their parents. Because... When you tell a young person to start a business and you say this will be your exit, this is the solution you would have, the parents would go back and tell the same young person that, but you don't have a job, you need to have a real job. So if the business which you choose to start is a small restaurant, your father will say, but you have a, a degree in business administration, why are you starting a small restaurant? So these are questions we have been battling with. So when you think about how we have approached, we came up with a program which we call the BEST program. The BEST program is a business entrepreneurship startup tool which has the core as the Empretech message. And when we think about this message, we are sending out simple signals like, start now with what you have. And this means that every young person is being asked to look for the opportunities. And one of the key messages in Empretech and in the, in the ETW is opportunity seeking. But how do you look at the low hanging fruits in your community and you start with those? And this could be sim as simple as starting a, a small laundry business within your community. And this is basically helping other people clean their clothes. And this may not be what the promise was when you were doing uh, a degree in a Bachelor of Science in, uh, in, in school, but the business can actually be able to, 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 to transform both yourself and your community. We talk about approaches of uh, how do you make sure that you're continuously improving. I mean, we have a young lady in the northern part of our country, and this is a part which was ravaged by war for a long time who started out just running a business, she's called Lapogo, she started out running a business within the market, but now she's currently doing business with South Sudan. And this transformation is the message of continuous improvement, making sure that that message is in there. And uh, 
making sure that we ignore the noise. Uh, I think one of the big challenges which we're having as a country is the inconsistencies in messages. If the answer to the job market is going to be formal employment, yet formal employment doesn't exist, then that means you need to change the narrative. But the narrative doesn't change until someone has finished their university education. So there's a need for how does this young person stand up with confidence to start a business other than saying that I'll wait for this job. So our approach has been get the Empretech message, simplify it in such a way that every young person can, um, can, can consume it. And I think as a way of... Um, what lessons we have learned through this. I think the first lesson which we have all learned is that you have to have a household approach. The attempt to say that you can pick an individual excluded group and take it out of the community is a dangerous approach. The moment you pick the young person, it's important that you focus on, their, on the people who surround them. Focus on their mother, focus on their father, focus on their guardian. In the absence of that, the young person may start moving but be pulled back by the forces of the community in which they live. So there is a need for you to actually take, an, uh, to take, a, to take a household approach in your, in your activities. And I think the second message could be uh, this question of uh, a mindset change approach. It is, I mean, you talked about uh, culture, Renata. And uh, when you think about culture, culture is so fixed that no one debates it. So. Uh, if uh, if um, if someone goes for for a family function and uh, one person introduces themselves as working for a bank, another person introduces themselves as working for an engineering firm, and then I introduce myself as an entrepreneur, do I get the same respect from community, or do they look at the entrepreneur as the person who has actually failed at everything else and has chosen to run in entrepreneurship? So these. How do you attack these mindsets? How do, you, how do you package that? And I think for me the message has to be broadened because the mindsets are so ingrained, so, so there are such pillars in our communities that pushing them down is going to be quite a struggle. In some of our communities there are businesses which some people shouldn't do. I mean we have a group of our, we have a part of our country where men shouldn't be seen cooking. So you starting a business as a chef is a bit of a dangerous thing because a man is what? A man is cooking. There are sectors where women have been totally excluded. I mean, when you think about how profitable the automotive industry is, someone kind of starting a repair shop and being able to repair vehicles. But you don't see women in that sector. And when you ask the women, they say, but I'm a woman. If I was a man, I would have tried out in this sector. So I think pushing that. And the question of mindset has to be brought in. Can be, I think as an institution, what we have managed to do is to put it into our training programs, but also become campaigners of this message through the media, through policy influencing. So as an institution, as an Improtect Center, what we have attempted to do is to kind of change the agenda, the entire agenda of the nation and try to focus on how do we build a mindset where people take ownership of the situation, make sure that they transform. So I think in conclusion, what I'll say is that as an institution, we have, we have managed to reach about 90,000 entrepreneurs over the 17 years we have been in business. But even in our country, this is a drop in the ocean. We are 40 million uh, people country. However, I think there is an opportunity. One of the key things in the Empretech model is this issue of mindset change. And I think that's a message which isn't just for the Empretech Center, but it's a message which you can sell to all organizations. How do we have mindset change in health, mindset change? How do we take an entrepreneurial approach to climate change? So I think, for me, uh, one of the key things which we have learned is Yes, the message is good for the training, it's good for the programs, but the message can be broadened and consumed by most stakeholders. And I think as Interpretech Centers, we are, we, are, we are front runners in that message. And what we are supposed to put on the table is, why don't we have this company? I think I'll close with a small story. One time, about, about I think it's about eight years now, eight years ago, one when the Minister of Finance was reading our, our national budget, 
one of the key messages he mentioned in that national budget is the need of building an entrepreneurial mindset. And as an organization, we can, we can, we can, we can share in that credit that we have influenced the agenda to that extent. And I think there is a lot you can do with the entrepreneurs, but I think broadening and influencing the agenda with this uh, mindset change message is, is a key success factor. So thank you. Thank you, Ronald. Uh, we are about you know, to close our session, but before we do that, I would still suggest that uh, you know, maybe we have uh, you know, some room for, you know, for, for a couple of questions or comments uh, around the table. So, is there anybody that wants to say something? Yes, please. So uh, I'm Manish Kotari. Uh, I am in the manufacturing sector, uh, working 28 years. Uh, so I was infected by the virus of uh, Empretec. And I call it a virus because it's something which is uh, a good virus. It's like good bacteria. Uh, I took this uh, injection in November 2018 with my director, Arnab. Uh, understood the program. Uh, have been able to leverage my growth by uh, doing a turnover uh, growth of excess by two times, uh, which would not have been possible if I did not understand the behaviors. So that was the first financial impact. And now I am a social and uh, commercial entrepreneur, building businesses, have taken this program to institutions. And today I got a letter from our institution and the government how we can build and embed this program in the existing systems without building a system. So that goes into the behavior of doing something better, faster, and cheaper. And that's what Empretec has taught me. And I would be very happy to also uh, share that we are trying to bring all the Empretec directors uh, together in India. Uh, I'm working with the government and the institutions in February end 28 29 and first where we can showcase the msmes of india entrepreneurs of india enterprises of the world come together on a platform and do business because that's all empretech is about thanks thank you thank you 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 had a question hello everyone uh, this is jen from zambia i have two questions um, how is Impratec working with the countries? And um, is it that they are just branches or countries form companies and affiliates with the UN? Uh, you know, I can uh, quickly ask, uh, answer that, but if you're uh, interested in more details, so we can continue because we are running out of time. But in Zambia, we have Impratec Center. Uh, which is under the auspices of Zambian Development Agency. Okay. And uh, so normally we don't call it franchise. You know, what we do is that we really link with uh, local institutions under the auspices of governmental agencies that uh, deal with entrepreneurship promotion. And then we uh, 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 train uh, national uh, trainers, certify them on the Empretech methodology, and then the Empretech Center takes it from there. Okay. So that's normally the pattern, but there are different, uh, you know, uh, aspects of that. So we can discuss it in more detail. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, any other comments, questions? Okay. So I think we also ran out of time a little bit over the uh, uh, schedule. Uh, but, uh, you know, I would really uh, like to thank all, all first of all, all the, all the panelists uh, for their excellent contribution to the discussion from really very different points of view. Thank you very much. And also thank also for the participants for your attention and we hope that you know that would uh, be for those who are not part of Empratec would be something that would enlighten you know further action on uh, promotion uh, entrepreneurship based on behavioral and soft skills development approach. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you again. Hello everyone. Uh, I just would like to make a small announcement uh, that there's going to be a game competition going on right next door, session room number five. Uh, there's just going to be simple questions asked related to the GC, and there's valuable prizes uh, to be won. So, so you're all welcome. 
And yeah, it's just going to take 15 minutes. So you still have time for lunch.